all of this tech. Um, oh, we will come to him. That's Vincent. I don't have any cats or kittens, but Vincent has whiskers. And Vincent shows up on exactly those slides where a kitten should be. So it all works out well. Um, I had the benefit of having some of the slides, I, I helped on some of the slides a while ago from some of our design people. So some of them are like really nicely designed. Others are not. Um, and you'll be able to tell which are which. Um, okay, so, tap. Hey, this should work. There we go. Okay, magic. Um, so, what does MFA mean? I'm Jeffrey Goldberg from 1Password. We make a password manager. Uh, and a chunk of this talk, just to give a little bit of background about how I came to be ranting about this topic, uh, is that we have, over more than a decade, uh, received many, many requests that two-factor authentication be used for unlocking 1Password. And uh, in discussing this with the people who are asking for it and looking at what it would actually mean for security, I've developed some ideas that um, I think and I hope are worth sharing. Okay, so what does MFA mean? Uh, it means Margot, our colleague at, at 1Password, who's a master of fine arts. Okay, maybe that's not what it means. Okay, um, okay it means multi-factor authentication. Uh, in certain cases, it's two-factor authentication. I'll probably use the terms interchangeably. Yes, we know there's a difference depending on how high you count. Um, uh, and there we go. That's what it is. Talk's done. Um, now, I'm not, unlike the talk that Pear keeps on alluding to, I'm not going to actually give any precise or formal definitions. I'm, my definitions are going to be exceedingly lax because well, you'll see why, because trying to do them precisely and formally, I then have to extend them to work out edge cases in ways that miss the overall point. So I'm just going to uh, continue. Now, so when talking about what does it mean, I'm not talking about a definition that we can use and say, well, now we know what it means. And, uh, the big concern is what does it mean for ordinary users when they sign up or use or select one pass, uh, blah, 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 uh, MFA? What, what do they think it's about? Uh, what does it mean for knowledgeable users? Uh, what, and then we should also look at what the actual security properties are that it offers. Now, this, of course, is really hard because there are so many different MFA systems out there. And I'm not going to try to cover them all. In fact, I'm going to end up just kind of talking about a couple prototypical ones. Uh, and it's not, anyway, you'll see what I'm going to actually end up talking about. OK, so let's start out pretending that I'm not here trying to trick you. Um, uh, and so just, just think off the top of your head uh, what sorts of things you might believe about MFA. Uh, does it mean that you need all factors to authenticate? Uh, does it protect you if your computer is compromised? Uh, does MFA protect you if the server is compromised? Uh, does MFA make it safe to reuse passwords? Uh, does having a second factor help you if you need to reset a forgotten uh, password? And if you kind of answered yes to one and five, you should kind of think about what that might mean. But these are the kinds of things that we should ask about what 
ordinary users might, uh, uh, might believe. And what I'm essentially claiming is that there are gaps between what ordinary users understand and the actual security properties of MFA. There are gaps between what expert users uh, uh, understand and the actual security properties, and that these gaps, these mismatches in the security properties and people's understandings, tacit assumptions, are, um, can lead to dangerous behavior and dangerous choices. Now, uh, I had earlier uh, presented a sort of an abbreviated version of this at the workshop on authentication at Soups, and they're all research psychologists, PhDs, and faculty doing actual user, user studies. And so I had a slide in here explaining what kind of data I had to back up my claims. I'm skipping that slide now, and I don't know how to turn it to put it back on. Uh, and the answer to that question was, I have no data. It's all anecdotes, um, which is not really a cool thing for soups. But I'm hoping that at least it gives some insight here. OK, kitten time. OK, there's Vincent. Vincent is a guard at a castle gate. Uh, Vincent is a verif uh, does verification. Who goes there? Penelope is proving her identity. Um, we will be talking about Vincent and Penelope quite a bit. And so, uh, a completely informal, inaccurate definition of authentication, but it gets the idea of what I'm trying for. Authentication is the process of proving that you are who you say you are. Um, uh, you provide your proof to a verifier who either accepts or rejects it. If V accepts it, they will grant you access to something. And yes, we can all quibble about these definitions, come up with cases where it doesn't work, but that's the basic thing I'm talking about here. So when you look at how um, the traditional password login works, or tra actually traditional back in Castle Gate, um, uh, you get, uh, you get uh, Vincent asks Penelope for a username. Penelope gives the username. And, uh, oh, there we go. Um, Vincent checks that this is a valid user on the system. Vincent asks for her password. Uh, Penelope tells her password. She speaks X, Y, Z, Z, Y. And, there we go. Uh, he now confirms that that is correct, and then he has the power to actually grant her access to the castle, and there we go. And so, uh, the typical problems with this kind of thing are, among others, there are lots of, there are lots of things, but I'm just going to talk about a handful of issues. Um, Vincent learns Penelope's password in this process. Eavesdroppers learns Penelope's secret. Um, P, Penelope never learns that she's actually talking to the right castle. Now, when it's a castle, you're probably pretty sure you're talking to the right one, but, you know, we're, we're really stretching an analogy, and it's going to get stretched even more later on. Um, okay, what do I have? Uh, uh, P's secret, if captured, can be used to enter this castle. So, you know, uh, it's kind of a variant of the second point, but technically it's different. Um, and P's secret, if captured, might be usable at another castle, because maybe Penelope uses the same password at different castles. Okay. Uh, and then there are some additional problems that probably don't apply to, uh, to, to castles. But um, 
what Vincent stores in being able to, to verify um, Penelope's password, what he stores might be used for learning Penelope's password. So this could be plain text or something well hashed, but still in principle and in practice crackable. Uh, Penelope is not informed when someone tries to enter the castle using her name. If someone attempts to enter using her name but doesn't have the password, Penelope doesn't learn about that attempt. And, um, and Penelope's password is the only thing that is needed uh, to get her in. There's no other proof that's used. Okay, now, there are some other... Um, so, looking at those problems, I'm going to make an incomplete and informal list of some of the security properties we want from an authentication process. Uh, one is that we want mutual authentication. We want not only Penelope to prove her identity to Vincent, but we want uh, Penelope to know that Vincent is really the right Vincent, that she's talking to the right castle. Um, uh, we don't have that in traditional password login. We get that second proof now through TLS is pretty much what is generally used, the authenticity of who you're talking to. Um, again, zero knowledge is a rough notion here. Um, and I've combined several things together. Uh, but basically, it's that during the authentication process, nobody learns each other's uh, secrets. Um, uh, Vincent doesn't learn Penelope's. Penelope doesn't learn Vincent's. And an eavesdropper doesn't learn any useful secrets. Um, TOTP fits nicely into this with... Uh, possible eavesdropper thing doing the replay. If you ignore the quick replay that an eavesdropper can do with, uh, with TOTP, that's actually a nice um, example of that. Okay. Um, we want strong and unique long-term secrets. Uh, so we don't want long-term secrets to be reused at different castles. Uh, and we want these things to be unguessable. Again, something like TOTP does this, you get given a long-term secret that's stored on your device. It's going to be unique and unguessable. Um, uh, okay, fine. Uh, you also want uncrackable verifiers. So when I said that what Vincent is storing might be used if captured to compute or to help compute Penelope's secret, um, ideally you don't want this. And um, uh, um, we've got a trick that we do in 1Password to achieve this. There were some people I spoke to here from Authentico who have an interesting um, way of addressing this problem. U2F um, addresses this. And then, of course, there's the distinct factors. Um, the notion that an attacker, to break the authentication system, needs to launch two separate kinds of attacks. You know, so one might be the capturing some bit of information, something you know, uh, but also then having to somehow capture something you have. So the idea is that, is that distinct factors mean that the attacker has to do two separate kinds of attacks. Um, okay. Uh, and then uh, another useful property is that Penelope is made aware when someone attempts to authenticate as her. Um, uh, things like push systems, like, uh, like what Duo uh, security does, um, does this. 
And uh, you may also legitimately want a reset mechanism. That is, if Penelope forgets her password, there should be some way to verify that she really is Penelope and uh, allow her to some process by which she can uh, uh, find her way back into the castle in the future. Now, there are some security properties that are absolutely not part of the authentication system, but because users might associate them with authentication, I'm going to list them as well. So these are not properties of the authentication system. Authentication cannot address these. Um, oh, right, and that's the slide I should have been showing when I was saying that. OK, um, I see the next slide here, so it's getting confusing for me. OK. Um, so there's the, uh, you want protection of the ultimate resources, not just the authentication tokens, um, uh, if the castle is breached. Um, and again, this is not something that can be done through the authentication process itself. That can be done through like end-to-end -end encryption, other things. And so, uh, you know, if you look at this. So that's the sign on that gate says, notice, keep gate closed and locked. Uh, and there's no fence attached to the gate. Um, and so here you've got a problem. How do we fix this? Well, you could add a combination lock to it. And there you go. That would require something you know. Um, and you could add a padlock to it, which requires a physical key, something you have, and maybe some sort of biometric sensor to this gate, um, you know, something you are. And this entirely does not solve the problem. Um, uh, uh, but I raise it because users might believe that a multi-factor strong authentication system for the gate may be protecting what's behind the gate in ways that it isn't. Uh, and now I'm really, really stretching the castle analogy further, is, um, is imagine if Penelope is, be, is bewitched and her precious stuff stored within the castle is kept safe even if Penelope is bewitched so that she is under the control of an evil wizard after she enters the castle. And this is an analogy to Penelope's own device being owned. Okay, so with these sorts of security properties in mind, there's no way to go through every instance of every uh, 2FA system out there. But I'm just going to okay. Um, I'm just going to go through a few examples of different 2FA systems in a kind of idealized form uh, to to help clarify the notion. So, chip and pin, um, something you know. And I live in a backwards country. We still aren't there yet. But um, but uh, chip and pin on bank cards, credit cards, um, both factors are truly required. Um, the thing simply won't work if you don't have the pin and if you don't have the physical uh, chip. Uh, the long-term secret in the chip is unique and unguessable. Secrets are never actually transmitted over the wire. And, uh, and uh, one of the reasons why this can work, where your secret, where your knowledge secret, the thing that you know, is as weak as a four-digit thing, is that uh, attacks on it, someone trying to guess various things, has a high risk to the attacker. You know, if you're guessing something, if you're guessing something online, and attacking a system that way, you have 
your automated thing that goes up until you hit the rate limiter. But if you hit the rate limiter, then the only thing that happens to you as an attacker is that you don't actually succeed in getting in. If you try this with somebody else's um, card and sit there entering in different numbers trying to see uh, uh, for you to, to, for you to get blah, blah. If you try that similar attack with a chip and pin card, um, you are physically present uh, to the merchant you're trying to pay or to a, uh, you know, to a bank um, cash machine, which is highly monitored. There is a risk of getting caught, not merely excluded. So, so, so chip and pin is actually an ideal, perfect example of 2FA. And it really works well for that, for that limited circumstance. OK, TOTP. T -O up, 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 back, back, back. I skipped ahead. OK, TOTP. Um, uh, I, I assume most everybody's familiar with how it works when you sign up you get assigned a long-term secret, uh, and then each authentication, uh, both the server and the client, is performing a calculation uh, based on that long-term secret and the current time. And so, um, and so it's really nice. Long-term secret is unguessable, unique, and not transmitted during auth. Um, uh, whether or not both factors are actually required to authenticate is not inherent in TOTP itself. That's up to the service to decide whether you actually need both or whether you can get by with one. And um, uh, it doesn't meet some of our other requirements. The long-term TOTP secret is actually just stored server-side. Um, okay. And then there are push systems. Push. Push. There we go. Then there are push systems. Um, again, like TOTP, it's not inherent in the system that, uh, that both factors are required. It can or can be, may not be, depending on what um, on how the service is set up. Uh, it has a really nice property of users being notified of auth attempts um, and probably has one of the best uh, um, UIs, um, user interfaces for this stuff. OK, and now something that is not a second factor, but I need it to give a contrast, again, to traditional, uh, to traditional logins. So a password authenticated key exchange, like SRP, Secure Remote Password, um, and other schemes, uh, the client and the server prove their identity to each other through the magic of you know, math uh, without transmitting any secrets. Uh, so it's password-based because it says P at the beginning of this acronym. Um, no secrets are transmitted during auth. Um, and it provides mutual authentication. Uh, the, it can't be replayed or anything like that. It's all nice. And um, as I mentioned, with 1Password, we add a little extra thing to make the verifier secret um, uncrackable, and our reasons for this are largely cowardice. Um, uh, we don't want to be sitting on top of any data that's worth stealing. Uh, what it says on the back of that truck is driver carries less than $50 cash and is fully naked. So the idea of being an unattractive target is, is a good thing. Um, Probably going to come back to this slide later because 
I'm actually, I really thought I had, I, I'm, I'm going through this, anyway, talking about why I'm going through it slower than I thought I would be is probably going to slow me down more. So, uh, um, why do services encourage people to use 2FA? And if you look at what happened when Dropbox first introduced TOTP, they did it because they found that Dropbox accounts were being compromised because people had reused their Dropbox passwords on other uh, services that had suffered breaches. So, so they were trying to address the problem of reused or guessable passwords. And so their use of TOTP was to give you something that really nicely complements typical password usage. The long-term secret's unique, the long-term secret is hard to guess, and the long-term secret is not transmitted. So the biggest threats that they were having to traditional password usage um, was nicely complemented by this. Notice that it being on a second factor is not really part of it. And if you read their initial uh, announcement and blog post about it, um, they're actually pretty clear about this. OK, so, so now we can get to misunderstandings. And I, OK, are, are you hearing me fine, or do I have a sound problem? OK, thank you. OK, um, so one of the classic security properties that's used for traditional pure uh, 2FA or MFA is that the authentication process remains secure as long as at least one factor remains secure. And if you think about chip and pin, this is this is fully correct. However, this notion seems to have confused a number of users. So in my discussion with some of our users insisting on 2FA, you'd get things like, if I happen to have a keylogger on my computer, if I use a public computer to access my account, and here they're talking about one password account, my entire account key, you know, certain secrets, could be copied by someone. I have 2FA. Um, so uh, what they were saying here is that 2FA would be a benefit to them because they could then unlock one password on a compromised computer. Uh, this should be terrifying. Uh, and then another user said basically the same thing. OK. Um, uh, so. Uh, another issue with a lot of things perceived or seen as 2FA is that they're often alternative authentication. They're, they're actually used as password reset mechanisms as opposed to requiring both. Uh, there's a history of account takeovers of Gmail and Google through SMS hijacking that never involved also acquiring the password. So people who were able to get the, you know, people who were able to do SIM hijacking uh, were able to get control of, of their target's uh, Google accounts and do a password reset without ever having to use the password. So a lot of things that may be presented are, um, as 2FA or perceived of as 2FA are actually making it easier for attackers. Now, this still might be worthwhile because password reset is a hard problem, but, uh, but it is a misunderstanding for users. OK. And then there is the weakening other factors. Um, if you think that 2FA is protecting you from certain kinds of things, Oh, wow, I'm running out of time, and this is my most important point. OK. Um, uh, 
So, conversation I've had many times. I use X instead of 1Password because X supports U2F for unlocking. Uh, as a result of using U2F, do you use a weaker master password than you otherwise would? And yes, that's kind of the point. And here, you are weakening the most crucial um, the most crucial part of your security because it is only the master password that's protecting you if data is stolen from your machine, the, because there is no actual authentication at this point. Um, because there's no actual authentication at this point, you've got zero-factor authentication, and the 2FA process is security theater, so authentication factors do diddly squat in defending you on these circumstances. If you're not familiar with this somewhat outdated American slang, diddly squat means fuck all, but I probably couldn't put that in the, in the slides. And this is all because authentication and encryption are actually very different. But again, to users, um, Again, to users, the, um, you know, they've only dealt with passwords for authentication, no concept of, of, of encryption. Okay, so, uh, replay, summary. Security properties of the systems are really complicated. Uh, people, including knowledgeable users, are confused. In some circumstances, using MFA may add only tiny improvement uh, tiny improvements to the authentication security, as if, such as when you're using a PAIC. Um, but uh, uh, in some cases, they allow easier account takeover, not harder. Um, they lead people to believe that they can do things on untrusted devices that are exceedingly dangerous. Uh, they might be accepting server breaches or the risk of server breaches that they wouldn't otherwise accept because they think 2FA is protecting them. Um, and they can, under, in certain contexts, like a password manager, end up weakening more important aspects of their security. Okay, and um, basically just... Uh, this is all speculation based on anecdotes, conversations with users. It'd be really nice if there were studies to confirm or refute my speculation about what users do. And then there's what we as a community should be doing about this. Okay. I'm actually done. 32 minutes, 52 seconds. <laughs> <laughs>